Funding for One Week in October provided by the Virginia War Memorial Foundation. October 1983, the United States military found itself engaged in two very different military conflicts, resulting in two very different outcomes. The first in Beirut, Lebanon. Multinational forces comprised of American, French, British, and Italian troops arrived in the region to act as peacekeeping forces between warring factions during a Lebanese civil war that began eight years earlier. The American contingent consisted of Marine Corps, Navy, and Army personnel. 24-7 combat and outdated rules of engagement left troops exposed to a number of threats. On Sunday, October 23rd, a suicide truck bomb struck the barracks housing the 1st Battalion, 8th Marines of the 2nd Marine Division, marking the deadliest single-day death toll for the United States Marine Corps since World War II. It was an attack that no one could foresee and untold devastation that few could ever imagine. Two days after the tragedy in Beirut, a second conflict involving the U.S. military was underway more than 6,000 miles away on the island of Grenada in the Southern Caribbean. Communist infiltration and a government coup meant the island was in chaos. Caught in the middle of the conflict were Grenadian citizens and hundreds of American students attending medical school at St. George's University. President Ronald Reagan had concerns over the construction of a Cuban and Soviet-backed airstrip with international security implications. He also feared for the lives of the American students. Acting on an appeal for help by Eastern Caribbean countries, he ordered a military intervention, evacuation, and occupation. Operation Urgent Fury launched in the early morning hours of October 25th. One week, two conflicts lives lost, heroes made, and countless lives forever changed. These are just some of the stories as told by Virginia veterans of their one week in October. The Marines were sent to Beirut as part of the peacekeeping presence mission, and uh, that was following the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in, on June 6th of uh, 1982. So you had the Israelis and the Christian Falange on one side, and then you had the Syrians, the PLO, and the many Muslim militias on the other side. It was perceived by many of the locals that the United States government had taken sides in the uh, what was essentially a Lebanese civil war. And the government of Lebanon was in many ways, uh, in, in many areas, predominantly Christian, as opposed to uh, Islamic or some of the other religions in the area. And so with the shift in that perception of who the United States was supporting, then the players there began to perceive the United States as an opponent to them and acting against their interest. And as a consequence, it was felt by many of them that the United States had become uh, a target. So when we first got there at the end of May, beginning of June, we had sporadic incoming fire, everything from small arms to automatic weapons to mortars to, to rockets. And I would say in mid-August on, we were in combat uh, every day and every night the intensity of the combat most people don't know about. So we were taking incoming uh, at all levels uh, from mid-August until we left on the 18th of November. That was very frustrating because all we kept doing was taking incoming fire. And there's this famous sign, I'm, I'm sure it was in the periodicals, uh, the Can't Shoot Back Saloon. It was one of the Marine positions out beyond the runway, east of the runway. So the, the, the rules of engagement were very simple. Um, we were not to engage any forces unless we were engaged by them. We were to keep our magazines in our weapons, no round in the chamber, and the, uh, the weapon on safe. Again, to keep in mind that we were engaged in, in, in combat operations uh, day and night. Uh, what was interesting is the, the militias, the Amal, the 
Druze, the PSP, Progressive Socialist Party, the Syrians, the Iranians who had a military presence there, the Russians had a military presence there. So we were basically situated in a static position with a lot of people that don't like the United States firing whenever they wanted to into our position, in their, our defensive position. Marines are used to fire and maneuver, uh, not static positions. So we weren't in the defense, we weren't on the offense. We were a presence mission and we were peacekeepers. So they weren't able to shoot back. They weren't able to do what they were trained to do, you know, which is fight. They weren't able to do that. So while there were bombs being aimed at these guys, projectiles, whatever you want to call them, while there were bullets flying towards these guys, you know, it was a peacekeeping force. So there wasn't nothing they could do about it. You know, nothing at all. So we were, uh, we were taking incoming the night of the 22nd into the morning of the 23rd, as we usually were in Beirut. Um, I was located on the southern perimeter of the, the airport probably about uh, 800 meters from uh, the BLT headquarters across from the runway. It was 6.22 in the morning. Um, I was just getting up from my cot inside a bunker. We all lived in bunkers by that point in time because of the consistent combat operations that we were uh, undergoing in a defensive static position. I went to sit up. I went to actually get up off my cot and the concussion wave from the bombing uh, 800 meters away knocked me back on my cot. Seconds later, I heard shrapnel going through the leaves of the tree next to the bunker. And uh, we, at that point in time, had numerous car bombs going off in and around Beirut. So I knew exactly what it was at the time. Above, uh, uh, the airport uh, administration buildings was a huge black mushroom cloud emanating from where the headquarters building was. So uh, about an hour and a half past my company commander and the company gunner sergeant came back. They explained to me what happened. The BLT headquarters was hit, uh, numerous casualties. On uh, Sunday morning, October 23rd, it was a cold day and my dad and I had gone out to go get firewood to bring in. And my neighbor yelled over and said, morning. And dad replied, morning. He said, did you hear what happened in Beirut? And dad looked and said, no, what? He said, they had some type of bombing over there. Is Joe okay? And dad says, well, I don't know, we'll go check. And then we went in and turned on the TV and saw the buildings. It was early in the morning, right at dawn, just after dawn. I was in my stateroom, right under the flight deck, and I probably heard an APU fire up, and I heard some activity on the flight deck, chocks and chains being dragged around. So I immediately got up, pulled on my flight suit, and uh, we started the motors, ran the throttles up, and we loaded uh, squadron personnel and medical personnel. The urgency of the situation was, you know, it was unknown exactly what the situation was because no one could raise the 2-4 mile on the radio from the ship. We were about 25 or 30 miles out. You know, line of sight radio traffic on the UHF should be no problem. All I could see and reported back to the FDO was a, a pillar of smoke. I could not raise the mile on the UHF. I'll always remember was this, this eerie dead silence. And the only, the only noise, per se, was a generator that I think was the only source of electricity for the Mao headquarters. I distinctly remember seeing shreds of towels, PT gear, uh, mosquito netting, you know, this is, this is how Marines live. I mean, you PT, you hang up your PT gear on your cot 
over your mosquito hat and you have your gear, that's just how you live when it's when it's hot. And Marines, that's just, it was just those sorts of things that were just shredded and hanging in these trees that had been blasted. I mean, literally blasted. So we still weren't sure exactly if that was the building that Joe was in or if it was another building. So we didn't really know what was going on. But then as we started watching the news and more, we started to relapse that it was the barracks and Marines were in. I know there are no words that can express our sorrow and grief over the loss of those splendid young men and the injury to so many others. I know there are no words also that can ease the burden of grief for the families of those young men. Likewise, there are no words to properly express our outrage, and I think the outrage of all Americans. There was a triage effort going on. Initially, we're, there were triage in the Marines that were actually blown out of the barracks, suffered significant trauma, burns. You know, of course, if you're gonna be pushed out of a four-story building and you land on asphalt and concrete, that, that's, that leads to significant mortal injury. But they were the first Marines that medical personnel could get to. My job when I got out the helicopter was to uh, support the Marines, but to go out and help dig into the concrete to find any remains or survivors. And once we got off the, the, uh, the, the helicopter, that's when I knew I was very much in, in a, a zone of combat because we started to hear small caliber rounds hitting the, the pavement. We were receiving sniper fire at the site. We were receiving incoming rocket and mortar fire, small, small arms and heavy machine gun fire and that continued throughout the day during the rescue. That's when I started to not unravel, but more or less knew that I was in a place where I didn't want to be. And that's when my heart started to beat really fast. That's when I said to myself, I may not never come home. Anyone who did survive the initial blast died of their, succumbed to their wounds. Uh, at that point in time, because it was so difficult to, to get uh, the cement, uh, rebar, et cetera, off of it. It was an effort that we were using. Initially, you used your hands uh, for lack of anything else, or garden trowels, or small e-tools. The idea being that we didn't want to hurt anyone that was still in the rubble, but it became apparent that the Marines that were still there were deceased. The effort continued all day long, working the pile. Uh, the, the continual effort to make sure that Marines in the rubble were extracted and uh, I don't know, within 48 hours or 24 hours, I, I believe, uh, that the, the Marines that were alive had been pulled from the rubble. There was a, um, a, a sense of shock, needless to say, uh, to, to see the, uh, the Marines that I had served with for the last few years, uh, uh, many of them dead, many of them in body parts, um, um, many of them still in the building, and, and we knew that they would not be coming out. It was, it was tough, but we had a mission to do. And of course, on that morning, 220 Marines, 18 sailors, and three soldiers were killed. It was on the fourth day in the morning. <laughs> I heard my mom scream, and I looked out the window and saw the chapel, and we knew that Joey passed.
mentally I couldn't, it, it didn't have time to think, really. It was just, I was just in motion. And uh, seeing that, it, it did devastate me because I remember looking at other people's faces and, you know, it was, and one guy had to walk away because he couldn't stand it. You know, that and the smell was very devastating. But it, it, it affected me more after I got back to the ship because I was able to lay in my bunk and contemplate it. You know, that, that's when it started to really affect me. I think the, as far as the emotion, I think it was a great mixture of, of both anger that this happened and the loss of life, man, was, was traumatic for everybody. I mean, it opened a lot of eyes to what could happen in a blink of an eye, even in, in what we were in, a multinational peacekeeping force. There wasn't so much peace, you know, and it was scary. I think we were, we were scared more than we were mad, but that was a large mixture of both. I mean, it, it was just a, a, a loss that should have never happened. Once I understood the reality of the situation where those uh, served with were killed and, and, and wounded, um, it became a uh, personal thing for us Marines. Um, again, uh, if we had the uh, orders, we would have loved to go on the offense, uh, but we did not. We were not given those orders. Uh, again, we were to be in the defensive, waiting for the, the fire to come in and not being able to do anything except hide in a hole in our grounds. When we did have the opportunity, we were ferocious in returning fire and hitting our targets. I think there was never a feeling of, um, oh, woe was me. It was never a feeling of, um, uh, come and get us out of here, we're scared. There was never that feeling whatsoever. The lessons learned from Beirut, I guess, is preparedness. All this terrorism was brand new, and uh, I think back then everybody thought, you know, all these peace missions we were on and everything was a piece of cake. And it turned out we were basically going into a um, country that everybody was attacking everybody. They all hated everybody until we got there, and then they seemed to all hate us. So we kind of walked into like a family feud. So to a certain extent, you kind of feel like, kind of maybe should have picked up on the fact that this was something that could happen. But back then, suicide bombings were, were relatively rare and there had been a couple, but you really didn't think about that like you do today. You know, you think about, and, and they haven't, they didn't have the numbers like they've had today where people think about, okay, suicide bombing. Back then you really didn't think about that. That wasn't really how things were done. The smoke had barely cleared in Beirut when just two days later, another major U.S. military operation was underway, halfway around the world in Grenada, the largest of several island countries in the Windward Islands in the Caribbean Sea. While Grenada gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1974, a coup in 1979 by revolutionaries with Marxist leanings resulted in the suspension of the island's constitution and the detention of numerous political prisoners. By 1983, internal unrest within the party led to violent and deadly clashes, including the assassination of the country's popular prime minister, Maurice Bishop, and placing thousands of civilians in danger. A covert plea for help by the island's Governor General, Paul Schoon, and other Caribbean leaders prompted President Reagan to launch a full-scale military operation. The invasion was intended to not only help restore governance and protect a vulnerable airport location against Soviet military operations, but also to evacuate the more than 600 American students attending St. George's University. The Iran hostage crisis a few years earlier, in which 52 U.S. diplomats and citizens were held and then released from captivity after 444 days, was still fresh on the minds of most Americans. Determined to avoid a similar situation, President Reagan ordered the military to plan and swiftly execute Operation Urgent Fury. Let me repeat, the United States objectives are clear. 
to protect our own citizens, to facilitate the evacuation of those who want to leave, and to help in the restoration of democratic institutions in Grenada. So we originally were planning to go to Beirut because it had been an ongoing operation for well over a year, and there was still uh, unrest between Israel and Lebanon. When we got the call to go to Grenada, and the Beirut bombing happened on the 23rd, two days before we went into Grenada, and in 241 of our comrades had been uh, taken, we were uh, disturbed. Uh, angered because we felt like we should have been there and, and that we should go there to help them right now. And we didn't understand the ramifications of what we were embarking upon in Grenada and felt like we were dissuaded from being there to help our brothers. Then the whispers started happening like, you know, did you hear about Grenada? And people were like, Grenada, what's, what is that? And they, it's a small island. It's got um, some American students going to medical school, um, and we're going to rescue them like that. So we headed down uh, there and held off the coast, and we're on the ship on the 23rd, thinking that we may actually go in. But I got to back up and say that it cost me a steak dinner when we landed, because uh, I made a bet with my company executive officer who said, sir, I think we're going in. I think we're going to go. Uh, go on and land on Grenada. I said, no, John, we're not going to go. And I, I said, I'll bet you a steak dinner we don't go. And I wound up buying him a steak dinner. And it got real quiet, real serious. You know, we were explained to what needed to be done in Grenada and that we, it was important, we had to do it. But we were anxious to go to Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, get a little payback maybe. You know, everybody. It's a very helpless feeling, but you know, you have to take your orders and, and there's somebody up there who's pulling the strings and we're just uh, taught to uh, do our duty. So once we got to Grenada, we really didn't have time to think about Beirut. The mission, uh, as I understood it, was to evacuate the American students that were in the True Blue campus, which was just north of the runway, but they also lived in the surrounding areas. Our mission in Grenada was pretty straightforward, do landings to secure airfields to allow for follow-on forces, and then to uh, secure the rescue of American citizens. There was a question about where we would, where we would actually pick them up, uh, but our, our mission was to get them off of Grand Anse Beach and get them safely uh, to Salinas. We were supposed to go in at the 02 in the morning. That got further delayed to 04 and then uh, 05. And we also found out that our objective that we had planned for had been changed because uh, Special Operations Forces and uh, Rangers and the 82nd Airborne were also going to be part of this operation. They formed up in what they called a stick. It was six to eight Marines with some uh, light infantry, some with uh, heavier weapons. And this young lad looked up at me. He was painted in the camouflage face paint and he said, I joined the Navy so I wouldn't have to do this. And I looked at him closely, he was a Navy corpsman, what the other services call a medic. Marines don't have any of their own. They come from the Navy. So he was going ashore with the first waves of the assault. They went up and got in the helicopters who took off in three waves, I think. And I just remember seeing their lights disappearing and then their lights went out. They turned them off. So, well, there they go. Godspeed. I was in the first wave to launch. I actually cycled back three times, twice back for fuel, the third time back to pick up the troops. Then we gathered up, formed up, and we flew into Pearls Airfield. That's where we made our initial assault on the east side of the island. 
with the Marines. For about an hour, it seemed as if nothing had happened. And then helicopters started coming back. Some simply to refuel, some to pick up the second wave for the assault, and some wounded already started coming aboard. It became obvious pretty quickly that yes, they had met resistance. And the island was much more fortified than you would think a small country of that size would be or should be. And we learned over the next two and a half, three days that was it not only the, I think the right way to say it is grenadine, grenadine defense force that they had. There were a bunch of Cuban forces and some who looked to be either Eastern European or Russian uh, were on the island. It wasn't too long though before we began to capture some maps and some equipment from the um, local militia and the PRA, but we were really in the dark as to the tactical situation. Our Marines were able to engage with the civilians and we gained a whole lot of information from them as to who the uh, uh, military leaders were and military members were. And what had happened was that the um, amphibious task force had reported that uh, a platoon of SEALs who, who had been sent in to uh, protect and evacuate the governor general of Grenada were surrounded and in trouble. But they were surrounded by people's Revolutionary Army troops and BTR-60s. And I think they didn't, they didn't feel comfortable trying to you know, shoot their way out because they had this guy with them who they had to protect. When I was laying down on the ground in the prone position, I was laying next to a Vietnam veteran. And um, he told me, it's gonna be okay. You're gonna be all right. I promise you, this ain't nothing. We're gonna go out, we're gonna do what we gotta do. And, and we're gonna, this is gonna be over before you know it. But we were the support platoon in case anything happened. And so we were just laying there waiting that's when my life changed. That's when it was different. And about maybe 30 minutes later, we heard some shots ring out, a lot of shooting. We heard explosions going off. And then they, I heard, support, get up. You're going to get the wounded. We heard C-130 puff, the magic dragon. I call him Puff the Magic Dragon, an AC-130 gunship. It came flying around the, the compound, and all I could hear was and was frying down at the compound. And it must have did it maybe, maybe about four or five times as it was circling the compound. And um, it was bodies everywhere. It was Cuban bodies everywhere. I mean, it was nowhere that a Cuban could hide. And we went in, we just, everything that moved, we were shooting at. I was scared. Yeah, I was, I was scared. And it was my first time ever being scared, and I was scared. I remember two aircraft that were lost to enemy fire. They were Marine Cobras. On the first one, the pilot came one of the pilots was later killed by the local troops. The other one was rescued, but was missing half his arm where a bullet uh, anti-aircraft round had taken it off. The second helo was lost when it was coming in, providing support in a rescue attempt for the first helo. It was shot down and went in the ocean.
remember seeing an army colonel on one of the upper decks that day. And he looked at me and he said, he said, you all right there? I said, yes, sir. This is something. And he looked at me. This was on the first day, late in the first day. He said, yeah, there's been people killed today. It brings the realities of uh, this type of thing in. And it's, it's not pretty. And uh, it's something that you can't train for. And that's why uh, some people have a problem forgetting those sites. But I think that it helps us sometimes to remember those things to push us on towards greater things and continued perseverance. We flew inland, hit our checkpoints. We immediately became engaged with intense fire. Both ridge lines opened up. I could see flashes and traces. I heard the aircraft being hit by gunfire. The right door gunner was hit. The right front seat screamed that he was hit. Uh, the caution panel lights were flashing. Uh, we were still flying, the aircraft was holding together. I felt a sharp slap on my back. Um, didn't feel any real pain. Flight lead keyed the radio and said, tighten up, we're going in again. So we came around. This time the fire was just as accurate. It was much more intense. And we decided to abort the mission. The aircraft were just too shot up trying to get in. We were supposed to go to the airport there at uh, Port Salinas, and uh, we couldn't do it. It wasn't secured. Uh, the Rangers were just not then jumping in. So the decision was made to go to the uh, Navy ships that we had observed on the horizon. And that was, that was an impressive sight seeing that flotilla out there. So the pilot decided to pick a single spot airframe or a ship and we began our approach. We had no radio contact because, as I said, we didn't even know the Navy was going to be there. We began our approach. The deck crew was frantically waving us off as we continued to try to land. Uh, the pilot uh, continued his approach, and wisely the Navy personnel uh, jumped out of the way, and we landed on the deck. And the control mechanism to shut down the engines was shot away. And uh, the co-pilot couldn't shut the engines down. And there's a very famous picture of the Navy going out with fire hoses and drowning out the engines of the Black Hawk because they couldn't shut it down. And uh, uh, they removed the pilot who was very seriously shot up. So the aircraft that I was on had 32 entry holes in the airframe. It's now about 7.30 in the morning. I'm laying on the deck uh, of the USS Moose Brueger. We were transported by CH-46 to the Guam where we were taken to the sick bay. It was sometime during the day that some of my soldiers came in to check on us to see how we were doing. And that's when I learned that uh, one of my pilots had been killed, Captain Keith Lucas. He had been flying Chalk 4. The soldiers were, were very protective not to give me too much information because they knew I was in no condition. And finally later that night, the doctor operated on me, and I can recall, as he removed the bullet, he dropped it into a pan that he had side, and I can recall the, the metallic clink, uh, which reminded me of the old Western movies that you see Doc Holliday operating on, on his folks. One of the problems that we had we didn't have enough intelligence on anything in Grenada. We didn't know who we were fighting, how many there were, what kind of weapons they had, and who we had to evacuate. Are you meeting stiff resistance? We found out there were two campuses of medical school. So the Army was able to get the true blue people on the first day, 
And then we flew in the Rangers on the second day to get them out of Brand Dance. Like all the intelligence of the operation was bad. Uh, they had pictures taken and they said, the beach is very, very wide. You can safely land on the beach. The pictures were taken at low tide. Guess what time we went in? High tide. So the 46s went in, and of course, when you pull power to control your rate of descent, all these palm trees are swaying this way. And the moment you land, you take power off, here come the palm trees. Aircraft zero, zero is hit by palm trees. Helicopters don't fly very well with half the rotor blades. So they had to shut down and that aircraft had to be abandoned. My role in helping to evacuate the American um, students, I knew that there had already been a large uh, portion of the uh, students evacuated from the True Blue campus, which was north of the runway. Uh, there in uh, Point Salinas. When we went down onto the Lance Iapley Peninsula, there were students there that had not been evacuated nor contacted or had contact with the American forces. There had been a uh, shoot to kill order uh, issued by the government of uh, Grenada when the coup happened and the assassination happened. So they were afraid to even leave their house. And they knew that there was activity going on. They could hear the uh, fighting on the next peninsula over. They, they knew that things were happening over at the airport, but this one peninsula that was had not been cleared yet, my role was to be part of the forces, and I think I was the lead force uh, going on the peninsula that morning to contact uh, the Americans that were there to tell them that there was additional evacuations occurring, and there was a place where the helicopters were going to land to get the students and then take them back over to the airport. And then from there, they would be loaded on American uh, transport aircraft and, and uh, gone back to the States. The students that I met were so relieved to see us. that I, I think that they had been scared from the shoot to kill order that was uh, given by the government. But when they saw us and they saw US Army, they were so relieved and so happy. One guy threw me the keys to his house. He said, my house is over there, beer's in the refrigerator. I'm not coming back here, help yourself. Of course, we couldn't uh, do that part, but we evacuated those uh, students to uh, helicopters and got them uh, flown over to the, the airfield for evacuation. When we got back to Salinas, and all, all those medical students, those Americans that we rescued were safe and alive and cheering, and cheering what we had done and hugging us. It had come full circle from being called a baby murderer back in 1971. You all have one hell of a lot of thanks to these guys who went in and got you out. One thing we learned from Grenada, we didn't know how to talk to each other. And by we, I'm talking about the U.S. military. Army had its own way of doing things, Air Force, Navy, Marines. We all had our own way of doing things and our own way of communicating, et cetera, et cetera. We were not able to talk to the Army or to special operations, and that affected the way that we could help them and, and uh, coordinate operations. We need to continually push information so that the people who have to execute are, are in the know. It's hard to put together a plan when you don't have 
uh, any information about the, the who the enemy is, where they are, and uh, what the objectives might be. I think Goldwater Nichols, which was passed in 1986, was a direct result of both the failed Iranian hostage mission and the uh, Operation Urgent Fury. So I think one of the biggest lessons that came out of that was a lack of joint coordination or joint communications between forces that were rapidly put together. They gotta be able to talk to each other and they've gotta be able to train together Nowadays, the military is very, very universal. You go to a one military base, you can expect to see people from all of the branches of the military working on that base, operating on that base. You know, there are commands that have Army units, Navy units, Air Force units, you know, Coast Guard units all working together. It's, it's a lot more common, and back then it really wasn't. So I think it's a lot better in, in many ways that um, everybody's kind of joining together and working together, sharing information, and and trying to accomplish, you know, the common goal. The results of Operation Urgent Fury, uh, well, I mean, quite honestly, we accomplished every mission and every task. The U.S. students were released or freed, and they gratefully acknowledged the fact that we did it. The communism was stemmed in the Caribbean, and the Grenadian people were freed of an oppressive, ruthless government. Uh, I think around day 28, we, the assault was on the 25th of October, and on the 28th we began doing mopping up operations, things had quieted down. The Grenadian people themselves were just very appreciative to have us there and to be reestablishing some uh, civility and, uh, and peace in the region for their, for their small island there. Tell Mr. Reagan all Grenadians are happy to know that he took this step in time to save our life and may God bless him. I remember the Guam had circled the entire island and those colorful flags that you see on ships, mass. I didn't know what they meant, but all these little flags flying. God bless you. It was flying from the Guam to all the people on the island of Grenada. One of my memories uh, from Grenada was the response and gratitude of the American people towards the Army and soldiers. It was very different than what I experienced when I came home from Vietnam. I returned home from Vietnam on July 6, 1971. I came through San Francisco Airport. I was confronted by Hare Krishna, who asked me if my medals were for killing babies. Uh, the response by the American public at that time against our army and the military and those who served in Vietnam was uncalled for, unprecedented, and most assuredly undeserved. It was nice to see the difference of what the American public did in just a little over 10 years.
I was a young pilot, 25 at the time, and uh, was not prepared for uh, what I saw in this particular cruise in Grenada and, and Beirut. I had great training. I was uh, ready to do my job, but I did not understand the ramifications of what war was really like. And uh, once you have been in combat, it changes you. Someone once said that uh, courage is not the absence of fear, but uh, the persistence through fear. And I felt very much that that was a uh, state of mind. Taught me to appreciate life, because you never know what you have. Uh, really taught me to appreciate our Marines who are the real unsung heroes. Those crew chiefs, they do something wrong or don't fix something correctly, you're gonna pay a severe penalty and we auger in. Those maintenance kids, the avionics men, the hydraulics men, the metal shop people, uh, they, the jet engine mechanics, all they get is tasked day after day after day to keep these aircraft flying. So that whole experience taught me, you take care of those Marines the best way you possibly can. I think that experience made me a better officer, uh, made me uh, very appreciative of those, of those Marines. Uh, and I, to this day, I, I love them all like, like they're my, my family. Because they all. And the most important lesson I learned was about saving and protecting Marines and some American civilians doing for others what they cannot do for themselves. Yeah. I had a chance to lift that, defend my country, and bring American citizens home safely. I want people to remember Joe, not as a victim. He did what he wanted to do in life. You know, he went out, he served his country, and he left a legacy for others to learn by. So for him, it was all about life. And I want people to know that, that life isn't given tomorrow, that, you know, you have to take it as it is and go on and cherish what you have. Americans write checks for our country that most people would not imagine. Um, and a lot of people have paid the price. They have paid the ultimate price. And we may not think it's right, but that's why veterans do what they do. That's why our service members do what they do for this country, so you can be able to protest, be able to speak your mind, be able to do the things you want. This was the beginning of the resurgence of respect for the military. The U.S. Marines were, de were, were identified as the man of the year in 1983. Part of it was because of Beirut, but part of it was because of what we had done in Grenada. It still is emotional. But it also confirmed why the profession that I had chosen, the career I had chosen, was the right thing for me. Because I could do things for people that they could not do for themselves. We hoped we helped the people of both Grenada and Lebanon start down a path that would lead to a better life for the ordinary folk there. When you get past the politicians and bureaucrats, and you just get down to ordinary folk. 
everywhere I went, anywhere in the world. We all want the same thing. Within our heart, within our society, within our country, anywhere in the world, the greatest thing you can have and the most precious thing that must be preserved is hope. Hopefully we were able to help preserve or reinstill a sense of hope in the average person. And if we did that, then I'd say mission accomplished. In Beirut, the Lebanese Civil War lasted seven more years after the barracks bombing and concluded in 1990 after a national reconciliation. Parliamentary elections were held in 1992, although terrorism, armed conflicts, and civil unrest still exist today. In Grenada, democracy was restored shortly after the invasion and a successful general election held in December 1984. To this day, Grenadians prefer the term intervention rather than invasion, and in 1986, a memorial was erected as an expression of gratitude to the United States and those who sacrificed their lives to liberate Grenada from potential communist rule. Time after time, conflict after conflict, American service members have risked and oftentimes given their lives to protect the rights and freedoms of others. In one week, 260 American service members lost their lives, 241 in the Beirut attack, 19 during Operation Urgent Fury in Grenada. Of those killed in action, 13 were Virginians. Their lives cut short, but their sense of duty and heroic efforts during their one week in October never forgotten.
Funding for One Week in October provided by the Virginia War Memorial Foundation.